Father Michael Halloran, Catholic priest who spent a good many years on silent, you know, at a silent monastery in um, Europe and in the United States. So welcome, Father. It's nice to have you here. Delighted to be here. Thank you very much. Um, and we're going to talk about you today. today oh, well, I hope you're not bored out of your mind. <laughs> we'll find out. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if we hear any snoring, we'll sort of pick up the pace or something. <laughs> right. So um, I know a little bit about you, but like, tell, tell me some more. Do you want uh, sure, ah, I can, just tell me some more? Sure, I can just, uh, well, uh, I was actually born in Denver, but uh, I moved, uh, uh, I was the eldest child of what turned out to be eight children from my parents um, uh, who uh, met at Catholic University once. He was from Pennsylvania and she was from Missouri, so I owe my existence to Catholic education. Um, but anyway, uh, he got his job, his career job at St. John's University as a chemistry professor uh, when I was one year old. So he moved to Brooklyn and eventually to Valley Stream. Yeah, Brooklyn, yes, Bay Ridge. Uh, and then to Valley Stream two years later, and that's where I grew up. I uh, went to Catholic grammar school and then was fortunate enough to win a scholarship to Regis High School, the Jesuit High School in, uh, on the Upper East Side. So I commuted in every day, uh, and that was a wonderful experience because it was in the 60s, the late 60s, when the Vatican Council was uh, just uh, happening, uh, mid to late 60s, and then, uh, uh, you know, all the social ferment of that time. It was a very uh, uh, exhilarating and challenging time for the church and society, so uh, I was really uh, into it. Uh, they gave a very humanistic and religious education, Jesuits do. Uh, so by the time I finished uh, my high school, I was ready to. Uh, I entered the Jesuits, uh, wanting to devote my life to God uh, in that way, and uh, spent uh, two years in the novitiate up on the banks of the Hudson River, which is now the CIA, Culinary Institute. Oh. Of America. <laughs> I was it's, like, what? You know, the Jesuits are a secret society, <laughs> but not like that. Yet. Um, and uh, uh, and then went to Fordham as a Jesuit and did my undergrad. Uh, majoring in uh, in uh, classical languages, which were my great love, Latin and Greek, and philosophy, which all young Jesuits major in anyway. But I also discovered early in my uh, Jesuit novitiate uh, something that we have and talked we've talked about the two of us uh, on the program, uh, the uh, life of prayer. You know, beyond what I was trained in, you know, the, the usual vocal prayers and liturgical prayer important as they are, I was trained in meditation uh, and Ignatian uh, uh, meditation and contemplation. And when I discovered the inner life, uh, I felt strongly drawn to a life of solitude and silence with God. Uh, so you know, I want to ask you, what, what drove, drove you? Right. What drove you <laughs> into priest, yes, priesthood? Yes, yeah, yes, exactly. Yes. What drove you to the priesthood? Uh, um, well, that's originally? a good question. I felt, I felt a call. Uh, having read the biography of the person who is now the patron of priests in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, the Curé d'Ars uh, uh, in the 19th century, uh, uh, Jean-Marie Vianney. Uh, and uh, I felt f from that time on, uh, 13 or so, the age of 13, hmm. a call. And uh, I considered it during high school. So even before I felt drawn to the Jesuits, I felt drawn to the priesthood. That's, that's a good point. Uh, so uh, I was... Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't know if I, if you want to, if you're comfortable talking about this, but I mean, what was it that drew you? I mean, is it the lifestyle? Was it? Do you have? Well, that's a good a question. I mean, looking God, back, looking or? back, looking back, I, I felt it was the life of dedication to God. Yes, closeness yeah. to God and serving God. Uh, that took a, you know, a, a social action kind of uh, uh, coloring through the Jesuits, but then through the Jesuits themselves, a strong call through the life of prayer that I was taught by them a strong call to dedicate myself entirely to in, in, in the inner life of prayer and silence and solitude. Another, an, another type of radical consecration to God that I just felt very drawn to. Uh, and I was only, what, you know, 20, 21 at the time. Right. Uh, all, uh, but uh, uh, so when I made my first retreat up in the, the um, new, new American Carthusian house in Vermont, you know, they said, well, for finished college and wait, wait a year. Uh, so I did that, and uh, I entered uh, the Carthusian Monastery in Vermont, the American House, uh, 
right after college. That's and summer. why do you think they said that to you? Why do they say, "Oh, finish college first"? Well, you, you have to have your human. You have to have your human foundation. Your Th good and base. that's why they sort of yeah, and also a psychological maturity. I mean, to grow, mm -hmm. they could see I needed to grow in certain ways, become right. more comfortable, you know, with just in my body, in life, you know, uh, yeah. uh, more integrated. Uh, and uh, that, that did occur during that final year, uh, to some extent. So uh, I was happy then to enter. And I was the first novice, the first, the first American entering in, that, in, in the United States uh, instead of being sent to France uh, ever. So that was in, in 1972. So I spent the next 12 years in Vermont uh, going through my, my monastic formation and my studies for the priesthood. Uh, I was ordained a priest in Vermont in, in the parish down the mountain uh, in 1979 and professed as a monk a year and a half before that. Uh, but since I was the first monk formed in the West, Western Hemisphere, and ordained in the Western Hemisphere, they had a, they had a big Catholic, in the Catholic News Service, a big uh, photo of me, my being ordained, the first Carthusian ordained in the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> it was kind of funny. <laughs> But since I was the first one, they said, oh, he's got too many rough edges. We, we, we better send him back to, to Europe and, and, you know, finishing school in, in Europe. So I was sent to the mother house, La Grande Chartreuse, which was founded by St. Bruno, uh, our founder. In, Is that in, the one that appears in the movie? Yes, Integrate Silence, Integrate Silence, 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 which was done uh, some years after I left, had left France. Uh, but I knew the people there, and, and so much so that I was asked by the film forum where the movie was shown here in New York, supposedly for two weeks, turned out to be eight weeks because New Yorkers flocked to it. Almost three hours of silence. <laughs> they were attracted. <laughs> Why not? Uh, but I did the commentary about five times. That was I did a good the Q and A. Though. I did the Q and A good, at yeah. the theater a, a, a number of times, and I very much enjoyed that. Uh, but that was where I lived. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you can you can see where I, where I lived, the Grand Chateau, in that film, yeah. which is readily available. Integrate silence. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this is a, an interesting point, perhaps, well, in a sense, from one perspective, the most fascinating uh, element in my biography, my CV, uh, I was in charge of the liqueur. Really? And the famous and chartreuse. You didn't, bring, you didn't bring a sample to uh, <laughs> Well, who knows what I brought. <laughs> but, um, what is in that big bag? Chartreuse, uh, by the way, the color chartreuse is named after the liqueur. It's a very oh. distinctive greenish-yellow color. Uh, uh, and it's the only liqueur, if I'm doing a little publicity here, uh, mm -hmm. the only liqueur that's naturally colored. Uh, that's why it's so potent. It's 55 percent alcohol, 110 proof. Really? Because it's colored by natural, you know, chlorophyll by the natural plant coloring. And if it were lower in alcohol, it would, dis it would disintegrate. So what's it made of? 130 herbs, which I'm not going to tell you. Oh, they're secret. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You and uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> there are like, I don't know, five living people who know the formula, so I'm one of them. You were um, one of them? Yes. Wow. Uh, um, but that was a great job. I had that for four and a half years uh, in France, you know, quality control and all of that. And that was like, as you're, as you're going about your silent day, that was your sort of your, well, your uh, job, Well, that's, that's a, a good way, yes. Uh, lived, lived the full Carthusian life. But unlike most monks, you know, I had this uh, responsibility on the outside. So I'd have to, I learned to drive in France for this, uh, you know. I had never learned to drive. A good New drive. Yorker yeah. doesn't know how to drive. Or, or, or <laughs> So I was, uh, uh, you know, I would have to go out. To, the distillery was about 15 miles away, so I would uh, uh, take trips there once or twice a week. And uh, uh, they actually computerized the whole system while I was there. Uh, so that was interesting. But anyway, that was a very good job. But the, the time came when they, they, they realized they needed to rejuvenate the English house uh, called Parkminster. Uh, and so they sent the novice master at the Grand Chartreuse, who was Irish himself, and a couple of us to England, where the, about the youngest monk was about 65. About the same age as you are now. Now. <laughs> he I was so old. I was 40 then. I was 40, <laughs> 41. It's uh, all relative, isn't it? Uh, so uh, that was, and I was, in, I was the, the procurator there, who was in charge of, you know, charge of the work around the house, the brothers who were doing the work and the uh, external ordering. So I still had a contact with the outside. And I think that's kind of the key to what happened after that. Uh, I found my best balance when I led a, attempted to lead a deep, deep life of prayer, but also had some contact with 
the word world outside. Mm -hmm. So in the end, that's what I'm hopefully still doing. In other words, I felt that that, that type of uh, extreme separation from the world was not serving, for me, not serving the purpose anymore, either of spiritual or of psychological growth. Hmm? And what do you mean by that what do you, when you say it wasn't serving? Well, I, 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 just, I just felt that I needed the stimulation and the challenge of, of the outside. Mm -hmm. For example, I, I knew that I wanted to explore, I felt more and more called to explore psychology and even more so Eastern types of meditation. Mm -hmm. um, I've often said that, that we, in the West we've kind of lost the, the teaching thread, the contemplative thread of our own tradition. And I think I had tried to recover that uh, you know, through the Jesuits and the Carthusians, the, the religious life, the, the special intense concentration on that, a sense focus on that. But I, I, I just felt that I was called to, to explore others. Even back in college, as a Jesuit at Fordham, I, I studied uh, you know, Eastern, Eastern religions and Eastern meditations. So it was a, uh, an abiding interest. And now it became more, uh, more pressing, I felt, for me to explore that. So uh, I did. When I, in 1994, I, I left uh, the monastery in England and came back to New York and quickly got uh, a job at a parish in Greenwich Village, actually. And uh, everybody said, what is it like passing from the silent monastery to Greenwich Village in Manhattan? And I said, well, they both are at the, uh, at the frontiers of the human spirit. So pretty much the same in some sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how I experienced it. So it was a very good parish, very open. Uh, there was an openness to the gay community there and, and a, a strong sense of intellectual exploration. They had a series of conferences called the Millennial uh, the Millennium Series, when cardinals and theologians were invited to, to speak in the parish. So it was a very, very dynamic place and a very good place to me. That's also when I began studying with my old professor from Fordham, Jesuit Father Robert Kennedy, uh, who's still around with us uh, and who's now a Jesuit Roshi, I mean a, a Zen Roshi. Just like? Well, I began studying with him, uh, working with uh, his group, uh, sit sitting with uh, his first, what we call Dharma successor, Janet Abel's, at uh, the Still Mind Zen, though, which is still in existence in, in Chelsea. Uh, and uh, later I studied more uh, intensely and directly with uh, Father Kennedy. So that in, so I had a Zen practice from 1994, then for 15 years, and in 2009 became a sensei uh, teacher, mm -hmm. formally recognized uh, through Father Kennedy uh, in the Zen tradition. And that very same year, I was finally formally accepted, canonically accepted, as a priest of the Archdiocese of New York by Cardinal Egan, just as he was retiring. Uh, and uh, up to then, I had been technically still a Carthusian, even though I was living outside. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, from, so for the last five years, I've been teaching as a sensei and also functioning uh, uh, as, a, as a priest of the Archdiocese of New York, even though I've been 20 years now in, in Catholic parishes in the Bronx and in Manhattan. Not all that time at St. Joseph's in the village. But, uh, so uh, that's a, in fact, in 2009, I was invited by Cardinal Legan to live with him in his retirement place on 33rd Street which is a very uh, fascinating, you know, time, mm -hmm. getting mm -hmm. to know uh, him and the, uh, the church in that way. Uh, but that's also where I uh, founded my first uh, Zen group and Centering Prayer group, which we've talked about. I um, uh, had a Centering Prayer group there. So I, I do uh, teaching in various Zendos. I have my own Zendo, uh, that is to say Zen meditation group, Sangha, uh, at St. Francis of Assisi uh, Parish, right by Penn Station, a very mm -hmm. well-known Franciscan parish. I've been there for a year or two now, uh, and uh, teaching various uh, zendos around. I give, uh, I give work, uh, uh, workshops and retreats uh, on centering prayer and meditation and uh, various Eastern traditions because I also uh, spent eight years studying with a, uh, really a, a, a Hindu master. Uh, doing yoga type meditations, uh, uh, which was very important for me. I studied the Kabbalah, although not directly with uh, mm -hmm. with a Jewish master. Uh, I was introduced uh, to that through uh, Master Choa Koksui of the Planet Pranic Healing Center, who was my yoga teacher, as I say. Uh, so I've had exposure to other traditions as yeah, well. So good. I've I can t I'm I'm certified to teach in two traditions, you know, the Catholic yeah. and the Zen, the Zen Buddhist but also uh, you have I, experience you know, a lot of experience of other, of other things. So yeah. I, I do a, a lot of interfaith work uh, internationally, 
uh, through the Global Peace Initiative of Women, particularly, with the contempl it's our contemplative arm, the Contemplative Alliance, and the Shin Yuen, I'm, I, I'm on the advisory, interfaith advisory board of them, which is a, a, they, uh, a, a Japanese Shingon Buddhist group, mm -hmm. very open to interfaith dialogue. We call it interspiritual work, not on the level of faith discussion, a concept mm -hmm. discussion, but as you would expect from my background, on the level of religious mm -hmm. experience, interspiritual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dialogue, so sharing, uh, sharing spiritual experience. And I've been to Japan and Bhutan and, and mm -hmm. I've been to very interesting places with them. Mm -hmm. So I'm very thrilled uh, to have all these uh, outlets. Mm -hmm. And I've never looked back mm -hmm. uh, on the monastery in the sense of I shouldn't have left, mm -hmm. but I've never looked back saying I shouldn't have entered. Right. I have a question about that. What was it like to spend so many years in more or less silence? Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what was that like? I mean, you. Well, it, it's, it's, not, it's very hard to describe. Uh, mm -hmm. First of all, you have to have a calling to it, which I certainly believe I did. Mm -hmm. uh, many times people come and they climb the walls after three hours. But uh, mm -hmm. since I had a call, I, I, I never felt lonely or, or I, mm -hmm. not even really scared. You know, a few times it was, I mean, it's, I mean any number of times it was difficult, you know, uh, various, you know, crises to overcome, you know, uh, stages to go through, you know, in your own inner journey, uh, or outer journey for that matter. But, uh, but it, was, it was basically wonderful, you know, it, was, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't traumatic or anything right, like that. Right, right. But I, I, we did reach a point where I knew I had to leave, and once I made that decision, it was easy to, to do it. Then you felt right. You yeah. Felt right. Mm -hmm. And so then let's jump back to yes. um, the mm -hmm. Zen, the com uh, that sort of combination of Zen and also the the yoga tradition, mm -hmm. um, and then the Catholicism. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like, how does how do you feel like that blends? I mean, how does that is there is there? It blends yeah, on it blends on the level of individual experience. You know, uh -huh. uh, I kind of like the idea of you know, the finger pointing to the moon. You know, there are various paths, uh -huh. and you can argue about which one might be higher from what particular standpoint, mm -hmm. and maybe some are. You, you know, uh, Catholics often say, you know, uh, Christians often say that it's all through Jesus. Well, it is all through Jesus, but you can approach even Jesus through different ways. And you feel like Buddhism mm -hmm. is a path to Jesus? Well, uh, Buddhism is a path to reality, and at the head of reality is Jesus, so yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. But, yeah. but the whole point is you're getting, even in Catholicism, you're getting beyond the words. Right. You know, we have Jesus' prayer and, and the name of Jesus, which is very precious, like, like mantras or words or names in other traditions, mm -hmm. too. But uh, even in Christianity, you have to go to meet Christ. You have to go beyond the words. That's what contemplation is. You're always going beyond even the holiest words mm -hmm. to get to the reality, which is always beyond words. Even a stone's reality is beyond words. How much more God's mm -hmm. reality or Jesus' reality? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so really, uh, you, there, all these paths are precious. I like to compare them to like a banquet. Mm -hmm. Some people may say, well, why do you need this if you already have that? Why do you need Zen if you already have, ha have Catholicism? I say, well, it's like saying, why do you need potatoes when you already have steak? Or why do you need asparagus when you have salad? Well, where's the problem? Mm -hmm. It's all one wonderful banquet, and it goes into the same stomach, and it all nourishes the same person mm -hmm. and, and reveals you know, various strands of the, of the multifarious beauty of, and wisdom of God. Mm -hmm. So you believe that all these different traditions are really just leading all to the same place? Well, ultimately. I mean, they have each method, each perspective, each wisdom tradition has to be fully respected for its own integrity mm -hmm. and its own completeness. Uh, I, I'm not a syncretist in the sense where you just, oh, let's take this and then throw it together in the old way. Uh, that's not correct. Uh, but if you do respect each one, you might achieve what my friend, the international uh, interfaith theologian Paul Nitter calls double belonging or triple belonging, where you can actually belong in a really real sense to more than one tradition. And I like the way he defines it. Uh, you find your basic rooting and your basic formation, your basic identity in one tradition, but from there you also find, as he says, substantial nourishment from another or other traditions. And that's, that doesn't provoke any conflict. It shouldn't. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't in me. I guess it my, needn't. Yeah. Um, I guess my question is, do, how do you feel about Buddha? I mean, he's wonderful. Can, <laughs> yeah. well, I mean, like all of these, you know, 
Sometimes, yeah. sometimes there's a tendency, especially in evangelical Christianity, to, to speak about these as demonic. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not, mm -hmm. not at all. I mean, they're great wisdom figures who, who can bring a lot of peace and inspiration you know, uh, to people of all time. Uh, and I think they all work together up yeah. in the heavenly sphere, is what I think, what I experience. You know. Yeah. Uh, uh, demonic things are, 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 are violence and hatred and, 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 right. and fear and, and I mean, all of that. For me personally, I have, I have this idea that like all the religions are, are saying a lot of the same stuff. Don't, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, don't The basic kill. moral <laughs> rules, <laughs> yes. You know, it's all the same. Um, at one point, I, you know, I had gone to um, a Buddhist thing and um, I didn't speak the language. And I said, oh, I didn't need to hear anyway because I know what they're going to say. They're going to say, don't lie, don't cheat, <laughs> don't steal. You know, and I said this to a, a Christian friend and he was, he was horrified. He was like, how could you say that? And I'm like, well, I think it's kind of true. Well, you the, know? Mor the, the moral you know, perspectives are certainly very similar and even identical in some ways, like, like the don't kill, don't cheat, uh, don't steal. I mean, that's right from the Ten right. Commandments and right from the Buddha, Buddha's precepts. Yeah. Uh, Buddhism's precepts. Uh, they're not the same in the sense, as I just said, each, each one has a particular path, a particular wisdom, wisdom uh, road to offer, uh, but they, they, they're all leading, I think, ultimately C to the same. Can you, can you give me some points about that, like the difference between how Buddhism is different than Christianity? Can you give me a few points on that? Well, uh, well for example, mm -hmm. they, they, they don't talk about God at all. Mm -hmm. Some people say, oh, that means Buddhism is atheistic or impersonal. Well, no, it just means they don't want to talk about it. And we could use a little bit of a dose of that, you know, more in the West, you know. Uh, uh, more of, an, more, is more of an more of a focus on, on, on the uh, deconstruction of the ego, which we could also use more of in the West. Uh, that's interesting. That's why one of Paul Nitter's best books one of my, is, is called Without Buddha I Could Not Be Christian. Hmm. In other words, there's a, there are certain foci, certain emphases in Buddhism or in other traditions that can help us uh, not only to supplement, but to recover lost elements like contemplation in our own you know, West, Western Christian tradition. Right. So that's where also the, the, the different traditions can collaborate to bring a fuller picture and to open up doors uh, in our own tradition that we might never have found otherwise. Right. So mm -hmm. we, in the, the previous half hour, we, we had talked about centering prayer right. and how centering prayer can sort of bring you back to to your center and the cent which is God, yes, and to make that connection, um, and then and then that whole thing about the centering prayer not being that um, widely publicized, yes, or that right. introduced we, we, we've in lost so many it. communities, yeah. But where kind of what you're saying is like with the Buddhism and sort of the the meditation practices that they introduce, they don't talk about God, but it does bring you back to maybe that same spot. Brings you to, to a centering, brings you to an inner truth, it brings you to an experienced reality. And you can call it what you want, but better don't call it anything. Or, or if you prefer, you can recognize how it's compatible with what other people have called it, or what they sometimes call it in, you know, in Buddhism too, Buddha nature or whatever you want to call it. So, so it's... It's a it's a wonderful openness of spirit. If 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 your spiritual experience doesn't lead you doesn't lead to openness of heart and mind and freedom, then you're going in the wrong direction. No matter what tradition you're in. Yeah. Say that again. Yeah. If if, it if your spiritual practice doesn't open your mind and heart and expand them in love and compassion, and if it doesn't uh, 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 lead to freedom, that inner sense of spaciousness, then you, something's wrong, psychologically or spiritually or socially or whatever. That's very nice. I like yeah. that a lot. At, yeah. one, at one point, I had um, been on retreat for a number of months, and, and, I had, and I had sort of decided that, you know, if whatever your practice you're doing is making you bitter or angry yes. or mad or right. whatever it is, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. And it should lead to these things of openness and spaciousness. I mean, and, none of none of the you know? none of the world tradition, the world wisdom traditions that we have, leads to a space like that. But a person's individuals practicing any of them can lead to that because they're not doing it right, or they're not doing all their soul work, which we also spoke about before, all the necessary work to uh, harmonize and uh, purify all the stuff, all the, the stuff, the gunk that's down there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really great. I mean, you have a really very interesting story, if you don't mind me calling it that. Yes, you know, it's a very right. interesting life. People always say that I should write a book, but I uh, think you should. Too. Uh, I, I tend to do better with this kind of personal face-to-face -face yeah. exchange, uh, preaching and teaching uh, live. 
Yeah. So, so I can at least spread the word that way. Yeah, yeah. You do have a really great story, and it would be interesting to read. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe you're not inclined that way. That's okay. Eventually, if I'm inspired, hopefully yeah. I'm in touch enough with the spirit, hopefully, yeah. that I can answer that call. Uh, or as you have enough of these conversations, like yes. certain topics will come up and it will inspire you to write something. Yes. You don't have to think of it as writing one whole thing. You just write it as like mm -hmm. little parts of it and then string mm -hmm. it together later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but each one of us does have a journey uh, that's, that's, that's unique. Uh, and we have to expect surprises in our yeah. lives. You know, if, if, if we don't have a huge change of mind and heart, maybe an ex a huge external change somewhere in our lives, then maybe we're not following the Spirit. You know, because it's an infinite journey toward an infinite goal. How could it not be full of surprises? joyful ones and challenging ones. Yeah, indeed. And so tell me, uh, where can people find you? Where am I? Yeah, yes, where, yeah. are um, where are you? Where are you? Besides right here in the studio. So we're always right here, as, as, <laughs> yes, as Zen yeah. says. So where else can we be? We're here now. Or if we are here. Anyway, uh, <laughs> yes, you can find me uh, on my website, uh, which is www.michaelkholloran, my name, uh, uh, .org. The K stands for Kevin, uh, that's my baptismal name, Michael Kevin, but hmm. it also stands for Koryu, which is my Dharma name, which means Dragon of Light. Mm -hmm. So I like to use the K in both, uh, both traditions, mm -hmm. uh, michaelkholloran.org. Mm -hmm. Great, mm -hmm. very good. So I want to thank you very much for being here today. And, um, great it's pleasure. Really, it's really been great. Thank you for listening. You know. <laughs> hope it's... Uh, Hope it uh, exhilarates uh, some people's search. I hope so too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know it has mine, and I mm -hmm. it's I feel like it's sort of bringing um, different pieces of myself together. So it's been really lovely. Yes, to bring it all together, and that's what it's for. That's right. Yeah, thank, you. thank you so much. It's a pleasure.